Hey, everybody. Welcome to Breakfast All Day. Alonzo here with Matt and Christy. It's Leon Day, June 25th. That means we are halfway to Christmas, and it's a, maybe a thing they made up for the internet, but I'm choosing to observe it this year. I don't know what Leon Day is. It's Noel spelled backwards, and it's basically <laughs> a reminder that you're at the midway point to Christmas. So, like, you know, if you're a crafter, this is a good day to, like, see that you've got all your 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 tools in place and figure out your time budget to get stuff done. You know, maybe it's a good time to start thinking about your gift budget and, and you know, what you want to get for folks and, and, and how you're going to swing that. Uh, if you have charities that you support only at Christmas time and have the means to do so now, maybe you could kick them a little something in the middle of the year. I'm sure they'd be grateful for that. Um, I'm also doing it's a, a thing. totally made up thing. It's a made up thing, but I kind of like. I mean, it. And we're, they're we're, all we're, made up things, right? This is true. Yeah, we're 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 doing a whole pre order thing for for the book that I did with the Deck the Hallmark guys for uh, uh, I'll Be Home for Christmas movies. Where if you pre order it this weekend and you send them your receipt, they will eat a sugar cookie in your honor and give you a shout out on a live stream they're doing on Sunday. So um, make them ill. That's the goal here. That's a lot of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat less exciting. important. It is my tenth wedding anniversary today. Mazel That's very exciting. Sir. Congratulations. That's, That's amazing. How will and you then, celebrate? Uh, well, I'm drinking out of my fertility idol mug from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, made by the uh, got it from Tiki Land Market Marketplace. If you want to get one of these, uh, so it's very happy. You're celebrating your wedding anniversary with a fertility icon. What are you saying, Matt? I uh, don't know. Uh, we are going out to dinner tonight. Uh, nice. So that's about it. And then I'll be spending some time in the pool, but Jen will not be because she's too fair. Oh, sunscreen. It's waterproof yes. sunscreen. She spends far less time in the pool than I do just because she will burn. And then uh, so sometimes I have to bring an umbrella out for her. Well, as a pasty person, I feel her pain, but I still like to go to the pool. Anyway, we have some news. The big breaking news of the week just happened yesterday, and it's Britney Spears. Mm. Actually, a couple of days ago, Britney Spears spoke at her court hearing. Yes. And between what she said and the documents that the New York Times got a hold of and released ahead of time, we got this really shocking and very sad depiction of what Britney Spears' life has been like inside of her conservatorship over the past decade plus. Um, you know, she has admittedly, she's put out this happy, perky face for her fans. She apologized to them saying, I have lied to you guys. I've not been truthful. Um, it's been hell. I cry every day. I'm miserable. Some of the more shocking revelations include the fact that um, she has an IUD in and she wants to get it taken out because she oh. wants to have more babies and her, she can't. Like under the, the wording of her conservatorship, she wants to marry her boyfriend, her boyfriend, boyfriend, Sam as Gary, not this, not the other Sam guy who was like clinging to her, Sam Lutfi. This is a different guy, ah. and uh, she wants to marry him and she wants to have a baby with him, but she's got an IUD and that she can't get taken out. Apparently, the wording of the the conservatorship is so strict and so controlling that it even dictates like the color that her cabinets can be in her kitchen. Right. She doesn't so, also right. I mean, when they talk about not having bodily autonomy as far as the conservatorship is yeah. concerned, that's part of it, which is shocking. That is That is horrifying. And I mean, like when we talk about in the larger sense, you know, women's right to have, you know, autonomy over their bodies and to decide to make decisions about, oh, reproduction for themselves. I, that's, that is horrifying. I hadn't heard that part. Ugh. Well, then the, the, someone else raised a question, like how did the IUD get in there in the first place? They only last about five years, right? You can only have maybe maybe six at this point. They're only good for they're not, they're not good forever. So at some point in the past five years or so, someone made sure some, some that she gynecologist get yeah some some gynecologist went along with this rather than be like no I'm not going to install an IUD in somebody who doesn't want one or maybe she asked for one at some point and has since wanted to take it out and they're not letting her. Also a possibility. Yeah, maybe she wanted it in. Anyway, but again, the the contradiction here, the awful paradox at play is that they insist that she can't function sufficiently for herself. So we've got to look out for her, but she can go and, you know, perform in Vegas eight nights a week, whatever, and make millions and millions of dollars for us. So right. she has pleaded to uh, Sam Asgari's her boyfriend. 
And uh, here he is. This is what he looks like. He is. Uh, I, I, I hope that, that she's able to get, you know, what she needs out of this. And I hope that, frankly, as so often happens, you know, things in the legal or medical world sometimes don't get a spotlight thrown on them until they happen to somebody famous. So, uh, you know, who knows what other people out there are being rooked into these conservatorships for somebody else's benefit where they are being stripped of their right to make decisions for themselves. And so I hope that this makes this enough of a topic where, it, you know, it, it will shed a light on other people who are dealing with the same crap. Well, that's what I care a lot was about. Right? Yes, exactly. That's what Rosamund Pike did, and I care a lot. She would prey right. on people who were elderly and theoretically enabled to unable to take care of themselves. Exactly. So, anyway, um, the Britney Army was out in full force at the courthouse in downtown LA. She was not there in person, and then I guess at the beginning of the hearing, they wanted to make it closed, and she's like, "No, I want this out there. I want the world to know what I've been going through." So. She that's wants smart. control of her life back. Yeah. Right. No, she wants, she wants accountability. So now, uh, so that's what happened. So hopefully that will, that will happen for her. And apparently all the, the other diva fan bases out there, the, the Bayhive and the lambs and the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the Katie kitties, what I don't know, the Katy Perry <laughs> people and the Taylor. So they were all like being very vocal in their, in their support of Britney this week. So I, as I, well, as was y'all... Justin Timberlake, as was <sighs> us weekly, who yeah. is fundamental in, you know, exploiting whatever hard time she was going through. Like, yeah. they helped they can, cause that. They can fuck right off. I love that <laughs> Justin Timberlake tried to tweet his support and everybody was like, nope, mm. Mm, take her name. <laughs> no, we're not doing this. Yeah, anyway, so that, that was our big news of the week. The other interesting news this week is um, the Mumford & Sons banjo player is, this, is leaving the band like hasn't he been talking this shit for a while now am i, I don't am know. I getting confused it, with some other musician his name is winston marshall he's the banjo player from mumford and sons and mm. he wrote this whole long piece in medium about how how we can't have any kind of civil political discourse in this country <laughs> anymore and the fact that he tweeted support for this right-wing author andy no then brought like cavalcades of shit upon him and upon the other members of the band and it's gotten so untenable that he just like doesn't want to hurt them anymore and so he's like pulling out of the band well but then he also walked back his comments about andy no and said that actually like he was negative about him and then everybody on the right jumped on him um and i thought apologizing yeah for apologizing i thought one of the funny things in his essay he's like look i am used to pissing people off i am a banjo player (laughs) uh but yeah, I, it's yeah. Don't say stupid yeah. shit. When people who watch Tucker Carlson lament the death of you know civilized discourse in this country, it's like yeah, no, we're not. Let's not. <laughs> so that is interesting. That happened um, last night. Was Conan O'Brien's last show? Did you guys watch that? I did not. No. Okay. Sorry, After 28 fly. years on air, Conan uh, said goodbye. I didn't watch the show. I watched. Um, his farewell clip, the last 14 minutes of his, his last episode on, on Twitter, where he said all of his thanks and tried not to get choked up. And were you guys fans of Conan's show? Not generally. I mean, like I, I, w- I would always watch somebody would invariably post the following day whenever Paul Rudd came on and right. showed the Mac and me clip. I yeah. did see Paul Rudd showing for the last time the Mac and me clip, uh, yeah. which was brilliant. Uh, no, I mean, nothing against him. I just, I don't generally watch any of the late night shows, so no. Yeah, I I got to a point where I just wasn't watching the late night shows anymore. Um, I had stayed up watching, Car- I mean, I'm old enough to have stayed up and watched Carson and watched that last show. Sure. Um, you know, I had watched Letterman for a while, but then I just ended up, I just got out of the habit of it. It's very late. We're in bed by 10. Exactly. <laughs> We're awake at 5.30 a.m. every day in this house, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, are the gardeners at your house right now? Uh, they are at the neighbor's house, so okay. I keep hitting the mute button. Uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing about a show like Conan is that, you know, the whole, like, celebrity comes on and does the interview. Like, A, all of that stuff is, all those interviews are so everywhere anyway and then the other part is, I know I especially and probably like we're the wrong audience because we're like immersed in that stuff more than the regular person is anyway. So no, we already know what movies are opening that Friday. Exactly. 
But in a show like Conan, though, there is the opportunity to play, I think, a bit and deviate from the traditional sure. interview structure where maybe it's not just the usual rote, polite questions and answers and going through the motions. Like, I, I admire the ambition of his comedy, like the fact that he would go for it with some truly out there stuff that maybe wouldn't land, but he'd at least go for it. One thing he was saying in his farewell last night was that he tried to find this intersection between like smart and stupid, like something that was <laughs> incredibly ridiculous, but also has some something smart to say about it. And like, if you could find that, that tricky balance in between the two, then, you know, that's like the, the dream he's always had is to achieve that. If I were watching late night talk shows, he would be the one I would watch probably him and yeah. like, and Kimmel because Louis Vertel writes for him. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, did you guys see that James Cameron did a masterclass this past week? You know, that whole masterclass series. Uh, like, I saw a, I saw a billboard for James Cameron's masterclass on Sunset Boulevard. When I'm I sure it was giant. It was giant. <laughs> uh, what did he say? 3D. He was, he was very candid about the fact that he's been a total asshole on set for like the vast majority of his career. Okay. And he said, um, I wish I could go back and, and be more decent to people and recognize that people are more important than the project. Like he was just, I think he referred to himself as a Tim Pot dictator. I, I remember hearing that like on the set of the abyss, he was really, really a pain in the ass, but um, uh, you know, I mean, I, here's the thing. He is not atypical in that regard. I'm sure there are plenty of like, you know, white geniuses out there uh, who are, are, terrors on film sets because they've been allowed to be and, and i think tacitly encouraged to be mm -hmm. you know that's how you know like, you're, that's how you know you're an important filmmaker you know right can you imagine what the coverage of kubrick would be these days <laughs> well I, that's the thing he always hit out i mean like you know i think even then it was sort of like yeah you're not i'm i'm not coming back to america you're not visiting my set like he right but sort i of... but but people would you'd hear reports from sets right like well, sure, because yeah. we hear that now and so yeah, I, I, I mean, good for him for acknowledging it. Um, you know, I mean, look like he's no Scott Rudin. Interestingly, but a point of contrast, he says that he has gone to visit Ron Howard on sets. <laughs> and he realized like, oh, you can behave differently. <laughs> and like Ron Howard's super nice to everybody and like compliments people on the crew all the time. And, and he's like, oh, like a light bulb went on. And now he acknowledges that he's trying to tap into his inner Ron Howard. But right. it's tough. Yeah, Ron Howard's a lifer. He knows how this thing works. You know, that kid <laughs> that was acting. Treat your at, people. He was acting at three or whatever, so he totally knows how to like. You know, you gotta treat your people well. The people who yeah. work hard for you. Um, so there was after we wrapped yesterday, there was a story in Variety about Chris Harrison's departure from the Bachelor franchise, and it sheds a little more light on what exactly happened there and what what exactly he got paid out. It, the early reports were that it were like, it was like mid eight figures. Actually it was $9 million. And then whatever he was owed for this season brought it up to 10. So it wasn't quite that much money. Ugh. Also the thing- Not the, quite. Not quite. The thing at the core of this though, you guys, was that he didn't realize how bad this was. He didn't realize at the time what the fallout was going to be. He insisted on going on this interview himself. He booked it. No publicist booked it for him. He went on there by himself. No handler came with him. And he, the, the host of it said that basically he just talked at her. Like he just said what he wanted to say. I wasn't really interested in the conversation. He just sort of talked uh, at her. The interview and then was he great. thought it went really well and was like, what's everyone talking about? This, this went great. And then didn't handle his first apology correctly. And like, it just wouldn't go away. Like right. he kept thinking it's going to get better and it wouldn't go away. Well, this was the interview with Rachel Lindsay, right? Who had mm -hmm. been the first black bachelorette. She wrote a piece for Vulture, oh. which I haven't oh read my yet. God. But it is Dave, scorching. Who, yeah, I Dave mean, who watches these shows was like, oh, oh, whatever NDA she had is clearly over. And she's like letting it all out. Oh, what did she say? I mean, knives are fucking out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... She takes yeah, no prisoners. It, she She's, describes everything like like the set of Unreal. Did you ever watch Unreal, Christy, the, the, the Lifetime show? No. Uh, one of the women who had been like key in the Bachelor in early seasons co-created this, this 
narrative series about a woman who's a producer on a bachelor type show and it's all about how like she gets assigned to like specific contestants and she's like constantly sort of like being in their ear and like you know trying to get them to do stuff that's going to be more dramatic yeah. encouraging them to drink more like all this stuff to like to create drama and the way that rachel describes it in this article is that like that is exactly yeah. what happens like you're 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 cut off from the world you're there's like all this booze not enough sleep you're obsessed with the bachelor because you're just it's like you're in this mini cult where you've been trained to be obsessed with the bachelor it's a, a the the bits he read me of it were like oh man yeah uh, coupled with like the feeling of being the black person on the show right. right like the the one who has to represent everybody and you know and then the like casual idiotic racism that just happens behind the scenes and, yeah i mean it's scorching it's worth reading cool i will for sure um, so there is that Harrison Ford injured his shoulder. You guys, he's not indestructible. Speaking of Raiders in Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford injured his shoulder, um, rehearsing for the fifth Indiana Jones movie for a fight scene, but production will continue around him. James I mean, Mangold is now directing this new Indiana Jones, like, it's not Steven Spielberg, and it's still due out in, in July of next year. I mean, uh, like I have no Harrison idea Ford, about the movie, but no, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, he broke his leg on the one of the Star Wars movies, right? Because like a door shut on it. Like he had to, you know, he got hurt. Like his, I think he broke his collarbone landing the plane on the golf course. Oh, that's like, right. Right. Like, I hope he's getting enough calcium. I mean, what's fun about like nobody plays the like fatigued. Hold on a second. I'm gonna still keep fighting you. I just need to catch my breath like Harrison Ford. So after every one of these things, I think like something happens to him on the site. You just think of him like, right. Okay. <laughs> it's life imitating art. Yeah. I have no idea what James Mangold's film is going to be like, but I do like the fact that he's already going after Twitter trolls who are bitching about this movie when like not a frame of it has been filmed yet. <laughs> he's good on Twitter. Yeah. He's smart and he engages. Um, okay. So the TV Academy this week announced that it will allow nominees to be recognized as non-gendered performer, quote unquote performer is how they'll be named. Um, also, they said that um, docs that are entering the Oscar feature or short competitions will be ineligible now for Emmys also. So you can't double dip. What do you guys uh, think about all this? Uh, the latter, good, like, yes, make them pick what, what lane they want to be in. The former is... <laughs> A nice try but here's the thing what the what the what the tv academy says is that basically if you win in your category when they engrave your emmy it will say best supporting performer or best performer mm. but when you are in contention yeah. you still have to be either in the actor or right. actress category so if you're asia kate dylan on billions for example who uh, identifies as non-binary you still have to submit yourself or the show has to submit them into the emmy race in one of those one of the binary categories so it's elliot like, page elliot page yeah like they basically you know well okay different because elliot page is a man Okay. So Elliot, Elliot Page will now compete in the Best Actor category. I see. Okay. That's where Elliot Page should be. But Asia K. Dillon and other non-binary performers don't hew to either category. And and so they're still going to have to compete in that category in order to win, in order to get a trophy that doesn't have a binary, you know, uh, appellation on it. So Wait, I thought Elliot Page was he or they. Right, but Elliot, but okay. he's still he. He's so, still he. Okay. I, I mean, I'm assuming based okay. on everything anyway. that, that he would compete as a best actor. Okay. But for not for non-binary performances, you are then shoving them into a binary thing, and uh, I, I think all the awards are going to have to figure out moving yeah. forward. What does this mean? And like, you know, do we eliminate gendered categories at all and just have ten nominees? Mm. Yeah, right. I know that's you, got you problems. don't because then it's all dudes. Too. Of course. Well, right. But historically, so, that's the problem, right? Is No, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not saying there's an easy answer to this, but somebody's going to figure out what the answer is to this, because this is a bit of a sop and it's an, a step in the right direction, but it's not really fixing anything. Does it make sense? You know, I'm just asking, like, I don't have thoughts either way. Does it make sense to have a third category? 
I don't know. And then are they being ghettoized? That yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's there's uh, no there's no good answer. That's a debate that needs to happen. I mean, like we know of a local awards organization of of critics that gives out a best you know male director and best female director award to ensure some level of parity. But at the same time, is that ghettoization? You know, that's that's an ongoing debate. It's complicated. But anyway, I wanted to make sure that we talked. We touched on that a bit. Also, Carl Nassib of Las Vegas Raiders. Don't call them the Oakland Raiders. They're the Las Vegas Raiders now. Carl Nassib came out. He's yes. the first active NFL player to come out as gay. And he also donated $100,000 to the Trevor Project. He- of, yeah. all, of all teams. Uh, right, and that the, the, the Raiders and that the Raiders like, organization is supportive of this. That's what uh, I, that's one of my like favorite on parts. On the of list, on, in the pool of <laughs> if you picked Raiders in the pool of who would have the first out player, right? You're, that was the, uh, you would have cleaned up. Odds. <laughs> yeah, you would have cleaned up. Yeah, no, this is a huge deal. We've had a lot of former NFL players come out after their career is over. We had Michael Sam who came out before the draft and then wound up not getting rostered anywhere. Look at me. Listen to me like I know what the fuck I'm talking about. Rostering, it's a verb. Right. <laughs> anyway, so yes, this is this is a big deal. And um, you know, this this counts as a as a landmark, uh, as a as a you know, in, in the in the ongoing history of of LGBT um uh, you know open participation in sports, particularly in pro sports, which is sort of one of the last I think kind of cultural hurdles, you know, like we can be in the military now and there's a lot of other, you know, but like sports has been the one that, you know, is a thing. So, so yeah, good on him. Good. Now the Raiders should go on a roll and hire Kaepernick. Oh, that'd be great. Um, Also, it seems like also in terms of sports that maybe it's easier somewhat or more prevalent somewhat for women athletes to come out right and still be playing actively versus male athletes i just finished watching the documentary lfg which Mm. is very good which is about the u.s women's national soccer team fighting for equal pay and um you know you have out players there megan rapino right extremely out and vocal um and then in wnba of course you have women who are, are actively playing who are out so i wonder if it's been easier for lesbians not easier certainly but more I, I think I think more, more lesbians. I, I think more lesbians have been doing it, and I think I mean, sadly, I think this is it's all thanks to the patriarchy, folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think maybe in a lot of cases, female athletes don't have the same risks of like potential endorsement deals or that mm-hmm. kind of deal uh, because they generally get paid less than their male counterparts unfairly, um, and so you know. Maybe they, that's just a that that's one of the reasons. I'm sure it's a I'm sure there's a complex web of explanation sure. here that I can't begin to understand because I don't do sports. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think for for you know for men in athletics, this has been like a real issue. And one of the big you know scare tactics, uh, as when we're seeing it now with you know trans high school students, is the locker mm-hmm. room. What about the locker right. room? Which is the same as you know back when 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 clinton was trying to get rid of uh, of, of you know the 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 ban in the army he's like what about the submarines it's like you know what? <laughs> guess what right. we can stand like that's not happening to, already we can stand next to you naked and keep our hands to ourselves it's amazing <laughs> right. how that works uh yeah i love the, the locker room like how do we go on with our terrible locker room talk if other people are there yeah <laughs> or or if male athletes are out they're figure skaters Right. And not even then. I mean, I mean like you'd be you'd be true. amazed at how many of them like th- even those guys wait to retire before they say anything. Yeah. Jason Brown just came out, which is not shocking at all. But he's just in the last, you know, during Pride Month just just came out. He's a longtime figure skater. Oh, okay. Um but yeah, well, like, it's, it's, now, there aren't it's that also, many of those either. Yeah. And the times have changed, right? Like it's I mean in the eighties and even the early nineties, like definitely the eighties not even female athletes could come out, right? Like it was always just kind of the rumors about whoever. And I think the nineties, mostly the same. And it's really only within the last few years. Like, I mean, when he was actively competing, Greg Luganis couldn't come out. Absolutely not. And there are like college uh, athletic programs that are still run by like majorly homophobic individuals or institutions. So you hear a lot of like, 
you know, NCAA women participating in like, you know, volleyball or different sports who either feel like they can't come out or they do come out and they get like kicked off teams or whatever. So this is, yeah. we are, we are not tied. We've not tied a bow on any of this stuff. Yeah. This uh, is still like a big ongoing thing. Speaking of shitty organizations, I think the NCAA is fucked with that what recent now? court case that said that, yeah, you know what? Maybe players can get paid for their efforts. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Even the the Supremes like said. Yeah, this, right? the Supreme Court yeah. weighed in. It was like, yeah, you guys need to let the students be able to pursue money. Yeah, if you guys are making this shit sure. ton of money off of the the team, off of their labor, and like doing all this much fundraising and this much stadium building and all that other shit, then yeah, maybe these guys need a piece of the action. Did you guys see the thing with the cows? that escaped the slaughterhouse and Pico Rivera. No. Okay, so no, but that's on, awesome. Like, on Tuesday, someone left the gate open. Someone quote unquote left the gate open and there was like a stampede of cows. Well, it was like David Holmes music playing in the <laughs> background because it was like a same a Soderbergh movie. No, but speaking of music though, so they rounded up all the cows, but there was one that was still out there like running wild and enjoying freedom. Um they Johnny finally made it. They finally rounded that one up too, but Diane Warren, legendary songwriter Diane Warren, has um, arranged to save the cow and pay for its freedom and to have it go live on a sanctuary somewhere. So when she says he's going to go live on a farm somewhere, it's not a euphemism. <laughs> no, it's no, it's it's a sanctuary, not a farm. Um, so go, Google, Google Pico Rivera cow. Pico Rivera is a town east of downtown LA. Oh, wow. Google Pico Rivera cows are like stampeding at dawn. It's majestic. That's wow. awesome. <laughs> Freedom! Go back and become hamburgers. It's very sad. Um, do you see that Mark Peel died? Do you know who Mark Peel is? Uh, Dave was telling me about this. But I did not really know who he was. So I know mainly because I just watched the Wolfgang Puck documentary, which is out this week. Oh, it wait, is... sorry. Okay, I'm thinking of two other things. Yes, Mark Peel is Nancy Silverton's ex-husband. Right. Mark Peel is a longtime L.A. chef and worked alongside Nancy Silverton. They both worked for Wolfgang Puck at Spago right. in the early days. There is a Wolfgang Puck documentary on Disney Plus that's out today. Yes. If you want to wallow in some 80s and 90s celebrity nostalgia, Spago was the place to be. And you can have uh, the duck. Yes, and you can have your your salmon pizza. And it's the movie's all about how you know he revolutionized the way we eat, the way we even think about chefs. You know, he had the whole open kitchen concept. But Mark Peel was like right alongside him every step of the way for a very long time and then ran Campanile. Campanile, yeah. And La Brea Bakery, which mm -hmm. Nancy Silverton is also a founder of, and yes. Jar, which so many movies are shot at Jar, including mm. Promising Young Woman. <laughs> And La La, La, La Land. Land just shot a jar. Anyway, really sad. He was only 66, and he had just been diagnosed with this really aggressive form of cancer like nine days earlier. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was all it was very very sudden. Um, yeah. The, their daughter Vanessa Silverton Peel was a producer at uh, Rachel Maddow for a long time, and I think oh. now she's an agent. I want to oh. say. And he did a lot of television himself. He did a lot of those cooking shows himself. Um, so he was a, a big part of the whole Wolfgang Puck California cuisine um, revolution here in California. So that was yes. very sad. 66 is very young. So he died. Um, we ha Rachel Ziegler, who is starring in West Side Story later on this year, already mm -hmm. has been cast to play Snow White in Disney's live action adaptation of Snow White. Once again, they are going back to the well and doing live action versions of their animated classics. This time, um, literally Webb, in this case. <laughs> yes, Mark Webb is directing and Benj Pasek and Justin Paul are doing new songs oh. to go along with the ones that already existed. They did the music for Speaking La, of La La Land. Land. La La Land and The Greatest Showman. Right. So that was some news that came out today. Um, Scarlett Johansson is going to star in and produce a Tower of Terror movie. I know how much we love movies based on Disney rides. Here's another one. This is the second Tower of Terror movie. That's the weird thing. What was they the did first one, one? They did one for Disney Channel years ago with like Steve Gutenberg. You used to be able to buy oh DVDs God. of it on your way out of the Tower of Terror <laughs> before <laughs> before they rebranded it from Twilight Zone to Guardians of the Galaxy. So yeah, this this attraction has already had another has already had a movie. Who's playing David is, Pumpkin? 
<laughs> S. Pumpkin. <laughs> Call him by his name. I'm just curious as to why, with all of her clout and all of her money, and she's got like a life and a family, and why would she want to go and do this? Like, this is what's baffling to me. Like, you can do any fucking thing in the world that you want to do when well, you're with your hands. Here's Maybe the thing. she loves I, the ride. I, I, sure. No, I, I think <laughs> this is a classic one for them. You know, and I'll tell you, even if you have that kind of clout and you and you're an actress who wants to be a filmmaker, it's not easy. Like, did you guys read the interview this week with um, Julie Delpy no. where she talked about how like she just is fried out by like how every time she makes a new movie, it's like having to start over and having to like prove herself and having to, you know, cobble together the money like she basically turned down. She told Rick, Richard Linklater she didn't want to do a fourth before movie because she's so fried from trying to get her own stuff done and would rather be trying to you know devote that time to getting her her stuff together. And Delpy has a proven track record totally. as a filmmaker at this point, so I can see for Johansson's like you're making a movie for Disney. It is probably going to do well, and a lot of times when you're trying to get that next personal indie project made it helps to come to the table with oh yeah i made this movie that had a 500 you know whatever opening weekend um you know so i get it she's playing the game yeah i mean i get that yeah i mean when you explain it the way it makes sense but i always think like oh scar joe no it's depressing but that's just how this works <laughs> yeah i, I hope Julie that it's i'm sorry i just i hope that it's a measure of her that she just loves the ride right like <laughs> because then you get this whole list of like who gets to adapt which ride, right? Like who gets to do Space Mountain? I want to. Gets... I want to see Justin Lin's Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I mean, that would be amazing. I would that's, watch that. That's the movie we're about to review next. Right, called, exactly. Called F Nine. Right? I mean, <laughs> if I was a filmmaker, I would call dibs on the Tiki Room, obviously. Uh, but be you know. Well, yeah, like, you know, F9 hasn't gone to hell yet. So, you know, that would be <laughs> There's time. A um, couple more things. The Peabody's came out this past week, and among the honorees are I May Destroy You, La Llorona, Collective, Crip Camp. Ted Lasso. I, I still haven't watched Ted Lasso. You've got to watch Ted Lasso. It'll cheer you up. It'll Is cheer it you up. I'm not sad. It It'll, I know, but it'll, it'll just it'll make, make you even happier. It'll, yes. <laughs> and season it'll two. give you hope for the world. Okay. Season two is just around the corner. It's coming up in July. So it's right. a perfect time to get caught up. I will. Right. Do you see it's the like whole... Paddington with soccer. Yeah, no, he's Paddington with a flavor saver. That's how I describe the character. <laughs> That's cute. That's really cute. Do you guys see this whole thing about Sharon Stone talking about Meryl Streep? Yes. And I'd forgotten that they were in a movie together. They're both in the, the they have a scene together in the laundromat. Remember? Oh. oh, in the Steven Soderbergh, the Soderbergh movie, oh, okay. where when she's looking at like timeshares in Vegas, like Sharon Stone plays the realtor. Yeah, uh, it was, I didn't catch the whole thing that she said. It was something about only Streep gets to be old. It, no, it, it was basically oh. the idea that like you have all these amazingly <laughs> talented actresses, but it's but when you talk about Streep, suddenly everybody genuflects. And I'm and and the thing is like you read it, and I'm wondering is she saying this like she and Meryl are buddies and they. Like she's saying out loud what Meryl can never say, which is everybody calm down. Or is she being kind of like about it? Like, I don't know, but it's, it's an interesting take. I viewed it as the former. Okay. I viewed it as the former because the people that Sharon Stone names as being on Meryl Streep's level, people yeah. like Viola Davis, Judy Dench, Judy Davis. I think she also, Oh, maybe said, yeah. um, Kate Winslet. Right. Um, are people that Meryl Streep herself, I think, has even said, like, are amazing actresses. And I think even, like, Meryl Streep is probably sick of the fact that she just automatically gets nominated for an Oscar every year, whether <laughs> she deserves it or not. So I think she was just saying out loud. But everyone, of course, pounced on it like, oh, it's so bitchy. Yeah. Who do you think you are, Sharon Stone? Yes. <laughs> do you see this weird story that John McAfee killed himself in a Spanish prison cell? Hours yes. after learning he was going to be extradited to the United States. Yes. Yeah, I don't know what to make of that one. <laughs> he didn't want to have to face tax evasion charges. Uh, right, and, and, but I mean, like, there, there's there are sort of there's the conflicting, like, oh, they're making it look like a suicide. He would never, and oh no, he just wanted you to think he would never, but he would. I I don't know. I don't know enough to to weigh in on that one. Matt, what do you think? I mean, finally uninstalled. 
Oh, oh too soon. Yeah. Yeah. The dude was a loon. Like, I, I mean, uh, yeah, who knows? I... He was unusual, but I want to read to you what his last tweet was, because he has a final pinned tweet. Hold on. And it the one says, that says that if I yeah, kill myself. It. Yeah. Well, here, it's kind of a farewell, but, but the U.S. believes I have hidden crypto. I wish I did, but it has dissolved through the many hands of Team McAfee, parentheses, your belief is not required. And my remaining assets are all seized. My friends evaporated through fear of association. I have nothing, yet I regret nothing. And then the day he found out he was going to be extradited to the United States, hours later, he killed himself. He regrets very, nothing. Very strange. That's his final, that's his pinned tweet. Very strange. Um, right. Also, he did say something to the effect of, if there's ever news that I killed myself, then just know that I didn't actually kill myself. What? Yeah. Um, that's a that's a hard one to stand up in court. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that was a strange story this week. And finally, the honorary Oscars have been announced. Yes. Samuel L. Jackson, Elaine May, Liv Ullman, Danny Glover. Are they going to televise this? Don't you want to see that? I want to see it every year, and yeah. they never, they don't. That's the, that's what sucks about this this governor's ball, this or whatever the separate thing that they do. I mean, in the last few years, they've honored like Jackie Chan and Agnes Varda and Frederick Wiseman and all these amazing Charles Burnett, and we don't and we get like snippets of it on the TV show. It's like, come on, fucking Elaine May is going to give a speech that is hilarious, mm -hmm. you know, and like that would be a better show than the regular Oscars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but no, I think the, these are all all very worthy. And and as Carlos Aguilar pointed out, um, Danny Glover like uh, helps get a lot of really interesting foreign films made. Like he's been oh, a producer really? on like Zama and um, like uh, I think uh, Apichapong Virasethakun's uh, Cemetery of Splendor and. I forget what else, but like like some really impressive films from other parts of the, you know, from Africa and South America and Asia, uh, you know, he is lending his clout to get those movies made. And it's like, all right, that's I, that, that is a that is a use of like star powered chits that I greatly admire. Yeah. Um, and Liv Ullman, you know, genius, great, great legend actor and, and filmmaker legend. Elaine May, you know, I think ahead of her time in so many ways. Um, I, I have a renewed appreciation for reading the Mark Harris, Mike Nichols book right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always defended Ishtar. Ishtar is hilarious. You are on records having always defended That's Ishtar. That's right. true. <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson would just be hilarious. And Samuel L. Jackson is, yeah, it's, it's like, come on. Anyway, so that is happening and maybe they'll change their minds and decide the world wants, maybe there'll be a clamor. Right? Or stream it or something. Come on, this is good stuff. Anyway, that's all I got for you for news. All righty. Do you have marquees, Matt? I, I do. I have a handful of marquees. Okay. Uh, this first picture comes from Scott Kerchak, uh, who writes, and we're back. This is the North Park Theater in Buffalo, New York. This was the film that was supposed to open the week the pandemic started. <laughs> uh, many of the films uh, were, sh many of the film scenes were shot near there. So it's the North Park uh, theater marquee. It says a quiet place part two. Um, great old school marquee there. Beautiful uh, building. Yeah, beautiful building. I grabbed some other ones um, at the Lake Theater. I'm sorry, the Grand Lake in mm -hmm. Oakland. Uh, last weekend, they put up Happy Juneteenth, uh, the new national holiday. Uh, so we got that picture on. The, it's, it's not one of the better pictures I've seen of the Grand Lake marquee, but this is the one we got. Um, mm -hmm. This one I really liked, uh, and this is the one that is opening, we use for the opening of the show, the Strand Theater. Uh, this is in uh, Delaware, Ida, uh, Ohio. Um, and I think that's the name of the town, if I remember correctly. Anyway, uh, it is. it says the big screen is back, uh, which I think we all know. Mm -hmm. uh, one more picture, the Times Theater uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, is reopening soon, so that's good news. Nice. Um, got this from the Brooklyn paper, uh, and I believe it's in Washington Heights. Uh, I'm sorry, not Washington Heights. Um, I can't remember. Anyway, Prospect it's the Times. Prospect Heights, maybe? May, I can't that's remember. You know, Brooklyn. It, Brooklyn peeps, correct me and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, and then last one, I caught this one. Um, 
fun joke at the Loma Theater. <laughs> Quiet Place <laughs> 2, Peter Rabbit 2, Hitman's Bodyguard 2. Uh, very droll from the person programming Marky at the Loma. Uh, yeah, that was a good one. Uh, good that's it this clap. week. Loma, right? well played. Yeah. I well, like it. well played, Loma. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's the best for... laugh around a marquee I've ever got from you, Alonzo. Oh, that's that's a good one. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us at BeFast All Day on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and check out our Patreon at Patreon.com/slash BeFast All Day. We're continuing our coverage of uh, Disney Plus's Loki, and this week is our uh, monthly off the menu selection, where our subscribers get to pick a movie for us to review and for pride month they have chosen uh the feature monsoon starring henry golding currently streaming on netflix we'll be talking about that uh all of that stuff exclusive to our subscribers and lots more fun stuff as well so check us out uh thanks for watching have a good week take care of yourselves and each other we'll see you next time bye, bye.